Productions. Hiya monsters and thanks for stopping by. Boy, it seems like it's been a minute since I've done any narrations, let alone some speed drawings, which it looks like it's been about two months. Good gracious. Aw, oh, shucks monsters. Well, I do apologize for that. But for tonight's video, I have five scary stories that hopefully help you fall asleep. Monsters, I really appreciate you guys and I really hope you like these stories. If you haven't subscribed yet, why not? Be sure to hit that subscribe button down below. If there's a notification button you gotta hit, please hit that too. If you're curious on what's going on on the downtime when videos aren't being made, I do try to post frequently on Twitter. Alright monsters, so sit back and get your warm milk ready and let the stories begin. The Shadow Man, written by Danger Raptor Anger. Now, I have a few short experiences to tell. Now, this all started when I was about 12. I'm 19 now. Now, my sister Zoe, father, stepmother at the time, and her two daughters, Jade and Maddie, now, we were camping. We had only been there for a day, and everything was fine. Then, me and my sisters decided we were going to go down to the stream by ourselves. Then my father gave us a walkie-talkie so we could keep in contact while we were gone. Now the place we were going was surrounded by bushes, and to get there you had to go down a little path. We spent a while with our shoes off splashing in the water when Jay said she could see someone standing in amongst the trees. We all looked and saw a figure. It was black, but you could tell it was the shape of a man. You couldn't see his face. We stared for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. Well, we forgot all about it and kept playing in the water, but I felt a little uneasy. A while later, we all looked back wanting to know if it was still there. And he was. Everything was silent. I could hardly hear the rabbits in the little stream. We stopped looking. And after about 20 minutes, we headed back to the campsite. My sisters lingered behind and I was about 20 meters ahead of them, but we couldn't see each other. I heard a twig snap behind me and I turned to look, assuming they had caught up with me. Nope. I turned to see the tall dark black figure literally a foot behind me. So I started running. The whole time I could feel him close behind. I ran as fast as I could until I was out in the open campground. He was gone. My sisters came out not long after that and I told them what happened. I asked but none of them had seen him behind me. They were too far behind and the path was windy so they were around the corner for most of the time. Throughout our camping trip, we didn't see him as much but occasionally we did see him standing there. Now fast forward a couple of years and we go back there. My father's new girlfriend and her daughter, Stella, I can't recall this trip as much but I know the facts that Stella saw him too. Three years ago, I started seeing the shadow man in my house. Just anywhere and everywhere really. And one day I was out in the backyard, and I started to lean down and pat my cat. When in my peripheral vision, I saw him right behind me. I ignored him as he's really never done anything harmful, really. I look at my cat as to block him out. As I do, I feel a hand grab my hair and tug. I immediately spun around. N nothing there. I had to leave the backyard, so I went inside as I was a bit spooked. Now I live with my girlfriend, and I can't say 100% if I've seen it again. I sometimes see shadows move behind me in the reflection of the TV, but when I look behind me there's nothing, so I just chalk it up to, you know, trick of the light. I did hear something recently. Now this is the most recent event I've had. My girlfriend's alarm went off for work, waking me up too. She switched it off and we laid in bed a bit longer. I was awake then, facing my girlfriend's back, one eye closed as it was smushed against the pillow. Suddenly, I kid you not, I hear someone whisper in my ear. It was so close, I could even feel the cold breath on me. I sat up and said to my girlfriend, did you say something? She looked confused, she was just sitting there playing on her phone. No, she said. She said she had it, which I believed, because the voice really didn't sound like her. This doesn't really relate to any of my other experiences, but I thought I'd throw it in anyway. 
It came from the haunted house across the street, written by Sir Scare Me. Well, after my dad shared his Halloween tale about the disappearance of his best friend Jake in the town's old Lantern Man urban legend, I asked him if he would tell me another story, and he did. Several. We were actually up pretty late that night talking about my dad's childhood. My dad said he had experienced so many terrifying and bizarre encounters, he figured it would be best to start from the beginning. To give you a quick introduction, my dad's name is Martin, but his friends called him Marty growing up. He moved to a small town in Mississippi when he was 8 years old. It was about a 20 minute bike ride from the Mississippi River. It wasn't an ideal place to live, but his parents could not afford much better. My dad ended up spending the remainder of his childhood stuck in this town. He plotted several attempts to run away but he wasn't able to escape until shortly after graduating high school. When his family first arrived to their new home, my dad immediately noticed there was something strange about the house across the street. It was two stories, but the top half leaned to one side like it could collapse at any moment. The old house was an eyesore for the neighborhood. Every glass window had been shattered and boarded up. It had once been painted a light green, but most of the color had been chipped away, revealing the dark, rotting wood underneath. The front lawn was nothing but dirt, with a short staircase leading to a roof-covered porch. When my dad asked his parents who lived there, they told him it was empty, and that he should never, ever go near it. My dad's bedroom window faced out in the direction of the street. He had direct view of the decrepit house, and as the days passed, he started to notice that both his fear and curiosity were intensifying. He began waking up with nightmares, terrified that something might be happening across the street. After his parents would tuck him into bed, he found himself frequently getting up at night and staring outside his window. He wanted to make sure that all appeared safe before closing his eyes. About two months after moving in, my dad stood in front of his window late one night and noticed that there was something unusual about the house. It had always been an eerie pitch black, but that night, there was a light on the porch, flickering in the darkness. He was afraid, so like any young child would do, he went to wake his parents. His mom and dad followed him back to his bedroom and together peered outside his window, but the light was gone. The pitch black darkness had returned. My dad swore and promised that he saw a light, but his parents assured him that it was probably just a bad dream, kissed his forehead, and tucked him back into bed. The following morning was his first day at his new school. He would meet some of his best friends in his third grade class. It was Jake, Boone, Grady, Parker, and my dad Marty. Now They would call their group the High Five Troop. They were inseparable and would frequently show off their super secret high five handshake in front of their fellow classmates. <laughs> they were definitely the cool bunch on campus. The boys were immediately fascinated when they found out where my dad was living. They each had their own stories about the infamous house and shared that their parents had also warned them to never go near it. There was a lot of mystery surrounding the house and their stories varied. But one thing they all agreed on was that it was definitely haunted. Now every night my dad would continue to check outside his window to see if the light had returned. About a week or so passed when he was awoken by a strange noise. The days had been warm and he would leave his window cracked open at night to catch an evening breeze. He silently laid in bed, holding his breath trying to determine what the eerie sound was and where it was coming from. He soon realized it was resonating from outside. It was a repetitive high-pitched creaking, like a rusted door hinge opening and closing over and over again. He got up and stared out of his window. The light had reappeared, once again flickering on and off. Now, however, this time he could see that the porch was not empty. Something was swaying in unison with the odd noise. He rubbed his eyes and slapped his cheeks, hoping that it was just his imagination or a bad dream. 
But he was wide awake, and the flickering light held just long enough to reveal what was making the disturbing sound. Seated on a tall, rounded chair was a woman, and with each creaking movement, she rocked slowly back and forth. My dad was frozen in fear and remembers trying to scream for his parents, but all that exited his lungs was a heavy breath of heart-pounding emptiness. He watched as the woman slowly sat up from her rocking chair. The tall, mysterious figure began to rigidly walk down the porch stairs, across the dirt yard, and towards my dad's house. She stopped in the middle of the dimly lit street. Now my dad says she was standing hunched over, with long gray hair that covered her face and dangled past her waist. He could see that her hands were raised out in front of her. She was holding two long crochet hooks and moved her hands back and forth as she stood knitting in the middle of the road. My dad was able to snap out of his paralyzing panic as he turned and raced for the hallway. He began hysterically crying at his parents' bedside. My dad tried to explain what he saw to his worried parents, but said he was barely able to speak clearly. His parents were finally able to calm him down, and his mom spent the rest of the night in the room comforting him. At school, he shared what he had witnessed with the rest of the High Five troop. They were captivated and his story sparked the boy's imagination with suggestions on how my dad should approach the situation. One such bright idea came from Boone, who sarcastically recommended that my dad just walk over, ring the doorbell, and introduce himself to his freaky neighbor. Now this got a good laugh from the group, but ultimately led to the concept for their final plan. The boys had all been told stories about the haunted house next door, but Jake, Boone, Grady, and Parker were ready to see for themselves. So, one night... They arranged to have a sleepover at my dad's house. They did not all fit in my dad's room, so they set up their stuff to camp out downstairs. With the hopes of catching a glimpse of the strange woman, the boys devised a plan to take a ball of yarn from their school's art supply closet. They would sneak out before it was dark and string each end from house to the other. They believed that if they were lucky, the knitting woman would take their bait and follow the line back to my dad's house. Jake was brave enough to volunteer to run one end of the ball of yarn up to the porch while the rest of the troop kept watch. It was a success. The plan was now in place, and all the boys had to do was wait. Absurd idea, right? My dad asked me. Yeah, maybe just a bit, I admitted with a playful grin. Well, we were just a bunch of third graders, but guess what? The plan worked. My dad continued to elaborate. The idea was that the boy would take turns staying awake. Whoever was on watch was equipped with a flashlight and was ready to wake up the rest of the group if anything suspicious happened. The nearby kitchen window was left open for the purpose of both running the other end of the yarn inside the house while also listening for the sounds of the rocking chair. My dad stayed up for the first hour, handing off the flashlight to Parker, before setting to his sleeping bag and falling asleep. He's not sure what time it was, or who was supposed to be on the lookout, but he was startled awake by a loud and familiar noise. He sat up, looking around the room. It was hard to see in the dark, and my dad started calling out to his friends, nudging them all awake. Who, who has the flashlight? My dad kept asking in a loud whisper. Boone had fallen asleep during his watch. He was alerted awake by my dad's commotion and immediately turned on the flashlight shining it in the direction of the creaking noise. The rest of the group was now awake and together they gasped when the light revealed an empty wooden rocking chair rapidly swaying back and forth in the corner of the room. Where did that come from? Boone asked startled. The boys were all terrified huddled together and unsure what to do. And suddenly, a deep and raspy shriek came from the darkness behind them. Marty, Marty, the voice cried. Boone turned around, shining the flashlight into the direction of the kitchen. And standing just beyond the open window was the mysterious woman, 
Barker was the wimp of the group and screamed, jumping into his sleeping bag to hide. The rest of the boys gripped each other tightly, interlocking arms. Oh, Marty, oh, what's your favorite color? Marty. What is that thing? Jake shouted. How does it know your name? My dad was just as afraid as the rest, and even more disturbed to hear the unfamiliar woman calling out his name. Boone was shaking. As you could see, he was struggling to hold the flashlight straight. The woman was slouched over with her head down. Her hands were moving quickly back and forth as she was holding on to her crochet hooks. What is your favorite color, Marty? Hmm? The woman said again as she began to move closer, one stiff and rigid step at a time. My dad was speechless, in a state of complete terror-stricken shock. Answer it! Grady shouted, shoving my dad in front of him. Marty... Oh, tell me, Marty. Hmm? The woman had slowly walked her way from the kitchen and now was towering over the terrified kids. She slowly lifted her head, revealing a ghostly face hidden underneath her long gray hair. She stared directly into the beam of the flashlight. My dad still vividly recalls her sinister appearance. Her eyes were dark empty holes, her face was sickly white with wrinkles on top of wrinkles, and the bottom half of her jaw dangled loosely like it was dislocated. Ah, oh, Marty, what is your favorite color? Marty, hmm? The woman scowled one last time before my dad shouted at his response. Marty, what is your favorite color? Hmm? Marty? The woman scowled one last time before my dad shouted out his response. Blue! As soon as my dad answered, the flashlight bulb exploded. The room was again pitch black. And all at once, in unison, the boys all let out a horrified scream. And then, suddenly, the lights in the room turned on. What in God's name is going on down here? My dad's mom hollered. The boys were all frantically looking around the room, but there was no sign of the woman or her rocking chair. Everything was in order, like nothing had happened. The boys tried to explain what they had witnessed, but my dad's mom was clearly upset by their crazy behavior. They promised that they would keep quiet for the rest of the night, but requested that all the lights stay on. This was only the first of many bizarre encounters Jake, Grady, Boone, Parker, and my dad would experience. They all came to an agreement that they indeed seen a ghost that night, but the story doesn't end there. Well, not for my dad. The boys never saw the spirit of the rocking chair woman ever again but my dad is pretty certain that she came back to visit him one last time. A couple short months later, it was Christmas. The last gift my dad opened was tucked behind a tree, in an unwrapped cardboard box. It had his name scribbled across the top in messy cursive handwriting. He slowly broke the tape sealed and peeked inside. What is it? His mom asked with excitement. He reached inside and pulled out a fuzzy hand knitted sweater. His mom began to smile. Wow, that is beautiful. Who's it from? It doesn't say. My dad responded as he could feel a rush of fear induced panic beginning to course through his body. His family never determined who the holiday gift was from, but my dad says he immediately knew. The first thing he noticed when he pulled out the sweater from the box was that it had been hand knitted in his favorite color, blue. My dad says his mom forced him to wear the sweater that year for the family Christmas pictures. Somewhere at our house, stored away in an attic, or some of my dad's old childhood photo albums. He insists that if we look through his pictures, you'll find one of him wearing a blue sweater. It was a Christmas my dad will never forget, and a haunting gift he wishes he did not receive. So, the ghost you saw, do you have any explanation for who? Uh, why? Or how the heck they knew your name? I asked him. 
Well, we were talking about the supernatural, so anything beyond understanding is possible, he retorted. But, I remember that Christmas my mom kept saying the sweater reminded her of something Nana would have knitted. Did you ask your grandma if the gift was from her? I replied. I never had the chance to meet my grandmother. I'm not even sure what she looked like. We had no pictures of her. My dad responded in a softer tone. She had passed away shortly after I was born. Sorry to hear that. I never knew that happened. I sympathized. So, then you are saying you think maybe the spirit you saw was... You choose to believe what you want, my dad interrupted. In the town I grew up in, your truth is all you had, because nothing else made any sense. My dad paused for a brief moment. Well, to answer your question, yes, I do think I was visited by the spirit of my Nana. But what else did I have to believe? You see, without creating your own interpretations, finding a plausible explanation for the um, improbability of what you experienced, you would just go crazy. And some of us did. My dad ended his story by saying he still has a lot of unanswered questions about what he and his friends saw that night. But there was one thing that he did know for certain. He never wore that blue sweater again. Skin Walker in the Woods Written by Dark Raven I live right next to the Navajo Reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teens. I walk over a lot since my best friend lives a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and usually only takes about 25-30 minutes. I've made this trip a dozen times and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way, so I'm not scared or on the edge. There's a patch of forest, however, about midway there. It is a little unnerving sometimes. There is always the feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I try to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind playing tricks on me. Now this day I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey through. I was ten steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know the sound. The one that screams there's definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure what to do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation. I whispered, Hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell through my lips. I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my voice. Hello? I started to breathe too fast. My heart pounded against my chest. I felt like I might faint. Hello? Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply. As my voice echoed over and over from the short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere, around me. Hello? 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 It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. Now for a long minute, nothing happened. The air grew stale, and I realized for the first time that there was no typical forest sounds. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets. Nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what would happen next. Stop it. It mimicked back. Stop it. I had enough and was willing my heavy legs to move uh, before I could take a step. I heard rustling in the bushes about 20 feet to my left. I watched in horror as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the brush. As it came out further and stood up on twos, I took off. I flew out of the woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, lay down and thought about what happened. 
My mother came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied that, yes, I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I might have been afraid of how she would have reacted. I called my friend and I told him everything. Now he freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. Now this terrified me even more. He told me to call him the next morning and he would explain more and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. Now that night I didn't sleep at all. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 o'clock a.m., just as I was about to drift off, the air changed. The night sounds quieted. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers up over my head like a child, far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it. It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said, but then it said something new. It called my name. Andy. My mother's voice. Andy. Andy. Come here. Hello? Stop it. My voice again. Now for the rest of the night, the creature outside the window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a fearful sleep. I woke up around 12 to my friend calling to tell me that he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what happened to me. He said there was a creature they called Yi Nuldushi, he who goes on all fours, or skinwalker. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into animals with the attributes it required and that it had caught my scent and knew me now. I also was given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me, and that I would always have to be careful. Last night I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said, in my mother's voice. And at one point it started calling my name, but drawing it out really far like, Andy. It tried to get me to come outside or to open the window to let it in my house. And this went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is it seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can take that. Hey, slow down, would ya? I shouted at my friend as he sprinted past the encrouching trees that surrounded us. We had been walking for about half an hour and I think he started getting impatient. He practically had to drag me and my other friend out here to show us some abandoned house in the middle of nowhere and he knew it was getting dark. I wasn't about to get lost out here for the night, not with it being a Sunday. My mom would raise hell if I missed any more school and my dad would probably beat me within an inch of my life. Him being the principal and all. You guys just need to speed up, he replied. I want there to be enough time to show you to everything there is to see. I rolled my eyes. Look, it's just some old house in the woods, Scotty. I guarantee we'll be done looking around within five minutes of getting there. Oh yeah? Well, that's not what my brother told me, Scotty retorted, slowing down his run and breathing heavily. He said that there was some pretty crazy stuff out here. Well, like what? My other friend, Zack, asked. Scotty turned to us, his smug face barely visible in the fading daylight. Well, I'm not gonna tell ya. Until we're there. So, let's get a move on. The three of us continued to walk at the same pace, our shoes crunching on the dead leaves that covered the forest floor. Upstate New York didn't have the largest woodland areas, but when it was late fall and the sun set on these dead trees, the woods were scary as heck. I wasn't getting scared though. I knew that Scotty just wanted to play a prank on Zack and I. This was all a ploy to get us to crap ourselves and run home screaming. His big brother was probably out here with some of his butthead friends, ready to jump us. Well, can you tell us why this house is so important? Zack finally asked, breaking the silence that only the distant crickets had been interrupting. 
fine. I'll tell you a story behind this place. And we'll probably be there by the time I'm done. Scotty surrendered, turning to us and walking backwards. I kind of was hoping he'd trip and fall flat on his butt. This used to be the house of Mary Very, he informed us, an eerie tone in his voice. Well, who's Mary Very? Zack asked. Even I turned and looked at him in surprise. Every kid in town knew about Mary. She'd been the meanest old crow I'd ever met. All the kids knew to stay away from her, because if you got too close, she'd smack you hard upside the head. No one would complain since she was so old and all. Disregarding Zack's ignorance, I said, well, didn't realize she lived out here. What makes you think this is her old house? Wait a minute. Who's Mary Vary? Zack demanded. Scotty ignored him too, addressing me instead. Well, I know it's her house because my brother said it was. You can't be that stupid, I said, unconvinced. Well, he could have been spouting a load of crap when he told you that. But who the heck is Mary Vary? Zack repeated, clearly getting annoyed by our lack of explanation. However, we just kept ignoring him. I know he was telling the truth, because right after he told me, my dad brought him into the other room and started yelling at him. I don't think he wanted me to hear, but I could tell he was telling my big bro not to tell me about it. That's how I know. He was on the up and up, Scotty explained. <laughs> yeah, that's some solid evidence right there. I laughed. Guys! Zack shouted at the top of his lungs, sending an echo through the woods and causing a murder of crows to fly out from their perch. Their calls drowned out the crickets for a moment before they faded away with the birds. We both looked at him and said, What? Who is Mary Vary? He asked the final time. How the heck have you never heard of her? Scotty asked. I guess it was before my family moved here, he explained. I had forgotten that he had moved into town after the old coot bit the dust. Mary Vary was the single most heartless woman to ever live in this town. I once saw her kick a puppy that was walking by. She used to smack kids around with her cane for no good reason and always threatened us to stay away from her home even though no one knew where she lived. Jesus, why did she do all that? Zack asked, amazed. Heck if I know, the old bat didn't need a reason. She probably just did it because she could, Scotty replied. So why the heck are you dragging us out to our house? I demanded. Exploring some dead woman's empty house was not how I wanted to spend my Sunday night. My friend snorted, because we can finally do what she always told us not to do. We can finally go on our lawn and into our house and break our windows and stuff. It's the ultimate revenge. I gave him a deadpan stare. Dude, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. She's dead, you moron. Who cares what we do to her house? You're missing the bigger picture, Scotty smiled. There's gotta be a reason she didn't want us coming around here. I bet there's some secret stash of treasure somewhere in that place, mm-hmm. You know how old ladies don't trust banks and keep their money safe after the depression? And she probably stuffed all her cash in her mattress or something. Raising an eyebrow, I asked. Even if that was true, you don't think the police found it already? Or the real estate people? Or even relatives? He went silent for a minute. I say it's worth a shot. Whoa! Scotty fell backwards, tripping over a small garden fence and landing flat on his butt. Well, Zack and I couldn't help but laugh. Dang, man, are you okay? I asked, holding a hand down. Scotty grabbed my hand and we both pulled. Yeah, I'm fine, he groaned, a bit embarrassed, but otherwise uninjured. All three of us looked at the poorly kept garden. No plants grew anymore just weeds popping up here and there in the dried up soil. We looked past the neglected garden to find an equally neglected lawn, which led up to a small broken down house. Holy cow, I told you guys it was out here. Scotty beamed victoriously, running past the garden and towards the house. Hold on you dummy, I shouted out after him. Don't just barge in there. Scotty stopped and turned back to me. Come on, man. It's obviously empty. Well, that doesn't mean we should just start splitting up, I warned. A large grin spread over his face. Oh, how I wanted to crack him right then. 
You aren't scared, are ya? He teased. And I knew that was gonna come sooner or later. You know what? Screw you, Scotty. Go fall into the basement and get stranded here for all I care. Scotty frowned. Well, fine then. I'll go find the cash by myself, and you two won't get a penny of it. And with that, he ran to the front door, kicking it and disappearing into the house. Ah, great, I thought to myself. Should we go after him? Zack asked. I shook my head. Well, that's just what he wants us to do. You realize he brought us out here to try to scare us, right? Yeah, I figured, he said, kicking the grass. Instead of following Scotty into the house, we walked the circumference of the yard. It seemed like a perfect circle. There was a house in the middle, the garden to the south, and a small utility shed to the west. There wasn't a road or even a walkway to be seen. Hmm, how does she get to the main road from here? I wondered out loud. I was thinking the same thing. An old lady couldn't have walked all the way from town from this place, right? Zack asked. But I have no idea. I replied. It didn't make any sense. I'd never seen Mary Berry drive a car before. But she couldn't have just walked through these woods every day. Not at her age. The sun had almost completely set, and the only light came from the soft glow of the gray clouds overhead. And suddenly, I felt a strong feeling to leave the woods. At that moment, it was the last place I wanted to be. Uh, we should go. Zat looked at me in surprise. Well, what about Scotty? I turned to the house and cut my hands over my mouth. Hey, Scotty, we're leaving in 10 seconds, dude. So you better get your butt out here if you don't want to walk through the woods alone. Well, 15 seconds had passed and no sound came from the house. I turned and headed for the garden. You're leaving? Zack asked. Look, I told him 10 seconds and then gave him an extra five. Hell, yes, I'm leaving, dude. I almost made it to the garden before realizing that I couldn't hear Zack's footsteps behind me. I turned again once to see him walking to the front door. Dude, what are you doing? I shouted, and he turned to me, making sure he's okay. I slapped my hand in my face. Look, he's just pranking us. Let him walk home alone. Zack shook his head. I'd rather find out he's just being a prick than leave him here if he really got hurt. Then he turned his back to me and the darkness swallowed him as he entered the house. Oh, crap, dude. I cursed to myself. I didn't feel like giving Scotty the satisfaction of going in there. But on the other hand, walking home by myself didn't sound like an attractive option either. Now, after a minute of pace in the yard, I decided to swallow my pride and enter the front door. The inside of the house was just as welcoming as the outside had been. It was mostly empty save a bed and a couch and a few other pieces of furniture. There was barely any light coming through the windows, the sun having already set and all. Remembering that I brought my cousin's old police flashlight he'd given me a while back, I pulled it out and clicked the button, fully revealing the empty room. The room I was in seemed to be a living room connected to a kitchen. Nothing remained in the house except the unforementioned furnishings that must have been left behind after Mary Berry's death. What caused unease with me was the fact that Zack wasn't anywhere to be found. I walked in not two minutes after him, yet he still managed to hide somewhere. I was beginning to think he had been in cahoots with Scotty the whole time. Okay, come on guys, this isn't funny, I shouted, louder than necessary. Nothing in the house stirred in reaction to my outburst. There were only three rooms that connected to the living room and all three were completely empty. There weren't even any leftover items to be seen. After looking everywhere else, I finally found a single door along the wall in the kitchen area. It was closed, but it was the only place they could have gone. I had been in houses like this one before, and I knew there were two possibilities of what was behind that door. Either it would open up to a closet, or to the descending stairs of a basement. I tensed up and turned the knob and opened the door, ready for the two to jump out. This didn't happen though. When I opened the door, only darkness greeted me. It was darkness, not merely the result of absence of light, 
but as if hell itself were setting right beyond the threshold. Only three steps of stairways were visible to me, the rest fading off into the blackness. I pointed my flashlight downward, into the dark abyss, only laughing when I realized it had died. It felt as if it weighed a ton on my outstretched hand, so I lowered my arm and turned, holding no illusions that I would even consider going down there without some sort of light source. Now, turning away from the basement seemed like more of a mistake than going down, because when I turned around from the door, I found myself facing an even more frightening sight. There, standing across the kitchen, was Mary Vary. Even the lack of lighting, I could see her plain as day. She was wearing a white gown with long sleeves and some sort of bonnet that covered her head. She also wore heeled shoes with white roses on top. I stood there, looking at her with eyes that bore terror and confusion. She seemed to only regard me with hatred and anger. Her brow was furrowed and her mouth contorted into a vicious sneer that gave off malicious intent. I could feel her negativity radiating, squeezing my very soul with this oppression and suffocating me with little effort. My breathing became short, sporadic, and my whole body shook violently. But I couldn't move otherwise. And she stepped closer, not cautiously, but forebodingly, like a lion would stand against a threat to its den. Well, in this case, I was the ignorant creature who stumbled into the lion's den, not realizing the danger and ultimately having my life taken by a pair of claws to the throat. That's when I realized something that scared me far worse than the fact that I was standing in the presence of a dead woman. What truly struck my heart like a sledgehammer was the fact that she wasn't looking at me, but past me. She wasn't sneering at my presence, no, but the presence of something far more menacing. This force was behind me, just coming out of the bowels of the house. It must have climbed the steps from the basement when I had my back turned, and now it loomed over me, oppressing in its presence, but far more threatening than this dead woman. Now, Mary looked at me directly, and her expression changed from one of anger to one of sympathy. Her eyes began to water, and for some reason, so did mine. We both stood there for a few seconds, crying over something I had yet to even understand. I couldn't feel my flashlight in my hand anymore. I must have lost my grip on it, but I never heard it hit the ground. I didn't turn to face whatever monster stood behind me, but somehow, I knew it wouldn't make a difference. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder. First it was just a firm grip, but then it squeezed hard causing pain to shoot through my body. The pain only lasted a second or two, because then I felt my head shake violently before I fell to my knees. Then I felt myself falling even further, plummeting into a pit of nothingness. I no longer felt pain or fear or anything at all. I simply continued to fall all the way down through the plane of existence until there was nowhere else to go. Then my consciousness left me. I stared out the window of Mary Berry's old home. It was raining outside, and the water droplets that landed on the window slowly traveled down the glass, using various routes to get to the bottom. And outside, there were police officers, EMTs, and reporters, all gathering around the small woodland abode. Inside, I stood with two sheriff deputies on either side of me. <sighs> I can't believe that psychopath was hiding out here the whole time. They'd been looking for him for over two weeks after he escaped. One sad, staring out the window. A police cruiser took a small road out of the forest that I hadn't seen there before. The back seat was occupied. Yeah, Richie Davis. He was in prison for three counts of attempted murder. The other replied. Looks like he was holding up in Mary's old basement when those boys came exploring. Did the investigators put it together? He shrugged. More or less. Richie didn't really keep anything to himself. He said the first boy entered the house alone when he strangled him to death and dragged him down to the basement. Apparently, he was down there cutting the boy up when the second kid walked in. 
Richie snuck back upstairs and punched him in the face hard enough to knock him out cold, then quickly brought him down to the basement so he could finish up the first boy. Jesus, the other officer commented. And then the third boy came in and Richie cracked his skull open with a metal flashlight. Sick, man. Said he only wanted to knock him out, though, so he was still living when he cut him up. They don't make movie killers as twisted as this wacko. Can't believe he only got 40 years the first time they threw him in jail. Well, that's not gonna happen this time. Two kids dead, one in the hospital, and a half-mutilated corpse? They'll give him the needle for sure after this. It would have been even worse if those hunters hadn't heard the screaming, stormed in on the prick and held him at gunpoint until the first responders got here. It's weird though, the hunters say they heard a woman screaming, the one pointed out. Yeah, that is a little odd, the other replied. No doubt about it, the one nodded. Well, come on, Captain wants us to make a statement. The two officers left me by the window and went out to address the growing crowd of reporters who gathered outside. I turned away from the window, once again facing Mary Berry. She looked at me with sorrow, but also with a slight happiness. I was surprised that no sadness had taken me. I didn't feel much of anything. Scotty stood next to Mary, giving me an apologetic look. He must have felt like this was all his fault. I smiled at him reassuringly, then took one last look outside as two body bags were wheeled over to a waiting ambulance. Mary Berry opened the basement door, where Scotty had met his end, but the basement was no longer there. Now it was a room with immense light, more powerful than any light I've ever seen. Scotty immediately walking through the door, as if he knew what lay beyond the light absorbing his figure until he was completely gone. Mary Very turned back to me smiling and reached her hand out. I took it, hesitating at first, but then, with conviction, she gave my hand a soft but confident squeeze, eliminating any remaining doubts I had. Whatever role she played while she was alive, I knew that now she was my guide, here to escort me someplace else. I walked up to her side and returned her warm smile with one of my own. Then together, we stepped through the door, leaving this world behind and entering another. The Haunted Sky Call, written by The Evilum. Now the day started out normal, just like any other day. I woke up early at around 5.30 a.m. I entirely shuffled out of the kitchen and got a bowl from the cabinet and poured myself a nice bowl of Lucky Charms. I sat down at the table and began to eat it. I was tired, but my mind was racing because I was finally able to talk to my friends. Uh, we'll call him James. Now, James had been my friend for like three years over Skype. He had been on vacation for like three weeks, so I was excited to finally be able to talk to him again. I went to school like normal, and when the final bell rang, I bursted through the doors and ran as fast as I could home. It was only about a five minute walk, so it was easy to run home. Once I got home, I turned my computer on immediately and opened Skype. I don't think I even took my backpack off. Now, once I got a minute to calm down, I went and used the bathroom, and I put my backpack down by the kitchen table. Note: I was usually home alone every day as my brother went to school and had football practice after, and my mother worked until like 7 p.m. I heard the Skype sound that plays when it opens, so I hopped on my computer and searched for James' name, and I found it. But before I could do anything, I got an incoming Skype call from him. And I thought it was unusual as I always called him, so I thought maybe something happened. And I answered, but there was no sound. I sat there confused, so after what felt like a few minutes, I spoke. Hello? James, are you there? With no success for another minute, I was about to say it again. But then I heard something. I heard a sound of fabric was being rubbed against his microphone. But then the camera came on, from his phone. And I was shocked because it was completely black with a faint glow from the left side as if the moon was shining in but it was supposed to be daylight. I sent him a message over text through Skype, but no answer. 
and right before I was about to hang up the call, I saw one bright ball shaped object shine to life. I then realized after the initial shock of seeing them that they were eyes peering directly at me. In less than a second I hung up the call and sat there scared out of my skin. I got another incoming call from James. I hesitantly answered and it was him. He said, sorry I didn't call sooner, I thought you would. So I replied, dude, you didn't get my message? You literally just called me. Sadly, he didn't get my message. He didn't even have a log of the call when I checked. Neither did I. Not even a message. I looked at my phone, then back up at the screen. When I looked, I saw nothing but those creepy eyes and blackness. I shook, and the entire log I just had with him was gone. But the old one was back. Well, I was scared, and I started to tear up. When I did, I got the message from James, and it read, don't be sad, be scared. Now suddenly, I felt chills go up my spine as I looked at the time. It said it was 12 a.m., even though it had just earlier read 3.30 p.m. I screamed and powered off my computer. Nothing made sense. It was nighttime outside, but I never noticed the hours going by, and with nobody coming home? In that moment, I swear I saw some thing standing by my front door. And I screamed and got so scared, I blacked out. Or so I thought. Now once I woke up, it was 3.34 p.m. and James was on the call. He was asking if I was okay because for the last four minutes, I kept saying on repeat, I see you, be scared. I see you, be scared. I see you be scared. I told him everything. And he said it was probably a day terror I had, but after my mom got home and I was done talking to him that day, I went on the Skype's files and found a chat log for 12 a.m. Ever since, I deleted Skype and I began using Discord. However, every now and then, I get a message from this unknown number on my phone. I block the number and nothing's happened since. Bleh.